Hello, Stitch people. It's Lizzie Bean here. It is a lovely Sunday afternoon, and I am in a cozy sweater, and I'm wearing no makeup, and I've got a sparkling blood orange and black raspberry San Pellegrino. And I thought today would be a great day to sit down and talk you through my latest portrait that I made. I tried a lot of new things that I cannot wait to share with you. Here is a photo of it. I hope you love it. What I decided to do was swap out a family name or a floral embellishment or background of some kind with black work. This portrait is for a dear friend of mine and his family and I just wanted something a little bit different. I wanted something that was a little non-traditional and I love the way it turned out. I hope you do too. So let's hop over to the recording of it. I filmed pretty much the whole thing and I'll show you sort of where I started, how I tackle a portrait, and how I went about doing this really unique black work background. Let's go. So first things first, this portrait took me a really, really long time to stitch. All in all, I didn't even film every single thing that I did and I still had, I think, 11 or 12 hours of footage. So I've sped it up a lot. So it's gonna kind of fly through, but it will give you the overview of everything I did to make this portrait come alive. So let's jump in. As you can see on the back, I've made a few markings about where the family layout is gonna be and where things are gonna go. And generally when I'm stitching a Stitch People portrait, I start with the feet. That way I know the character is exactly where it needs to be and I can just sort of go up and out from there. As opposed to starting you know, on one side of a hairstyle and maybe I go the wrong direction, I've done it before. So just for me personally, I generally start at the bottom and work my way up of a Stitch People character, especially the first one in a portrait. Others, maybe not, I might start from a different reference point, but. I tend to work in rows as opposed to completing individual cross stitches at a time, as you can see. That makes for a nice neat background I've found. <laughs> uh, but as I switch my floss over here, I'm gonna be working on a plaid shirt. So I've got like a t-shirt under and a plaid shirt open over. And we've got a bunch of patterns for this in the Do It Yourself Stitch People book, how plaid can work. But this is just me filling in sort of every other square of a dark gray. This is a um, gray and black plaid button-up shirt that I'm that I'm working on here. So now I'm going through and I'm filling in black. This is a combination. I've got some stitches are all dark gray, some stitches are all black, and some stitches are a combination of like a lighter gray, medium gray, and a really, really dark black gray. So that's what gives the plaid sort of that crossover look that you see in, in, uh, in real plaid <laughs> where the colors meet. And you can see, you know, I'm just starting and stopping as needed tying my tail down, and now I'm filling in the undershirt, the t-shirt portion with black, just taking that from bottom to top. One thing that is unique about this portrait is there are numbers of uh, tattoos and piercings that I tackled, so you'll see that come along and see as I've, you know, stopped, the sleeves are rolled up a little bit, so I'm gonna tackle the arms there in a certain way here pretty soon. Um, that's just something to keep an eye out for. It was a fun, fun challenge to always get all those little details. And just as a heads up, as you see me stitch this, sometimes I really needed to focus and I pull my work a little bit closer to me and it gets a little bit hard to see sometimes. I'm still learning and trying to be good about this overhead view. So thank you for your patience. <laughs> So here I've started to fill in some of the skin tone and even though I do intend to put the tattoo details in the portrait, I did decide to stitch all of the skin as a full skin tone color and then I went back and put uh, tattoos over top. We've got some on the hands and forearms and on the neck area. So I also have a beard on this character. So I left out the very bottom of the chin because that's where the the beard is gonna go, and we'll get to that in a second. And I'm just filling in around the face with the flesh tone color. I do tend to go a character at a time as opposed to doing like all the clothes and then all the skin tones and then all the eyes. I'll just, I like to go start to finish character to character. So here I am stitching a baseball cap onto my character. It's a sort of a royal blue cap and I tried something very, very new for this hat that I'm really excited to show you. 
it'll it'll come when I do the the text on the hat, but it says New York in white text. And not only did I split my threads, you know, we've got six strand floss and I split it into we've got six strand floss and I split it apart so that I had one thread. I actually very, very carefully split apart that one thread into its little halves that it's made up of to get an extra, extra fine thread to stitch that wording onto the hat. So you'll see that a little bit later, but I've never done that before and I think it worked out great. I actually ended up cutting out my first attempt and redoing it so it looked extra neat and I used a beading needle so it's extra, extra thin. I had a lot of control over that thread, um, but you'll see that come into play here. So I did a little bit of an outline around the hat with just one thread of black and now I'm filling in the eyes with three strands of DMC 310. And now I'm choosing my colors for the beard. I love to do, especially with beards, um, a mix of colors. So I'm using one thread from three different colors combined so that you get a lot of that color and texture that you often see in a man's beard, whether a little gray is coming through or we've got, in this case, different shades of kind of blondish brownish auburn. That really, really helps. So I laid down a cross stitch base where all of the cross stitches are, and then I'm going over that cross stitch base with some straight stitches to give it just the right direction and texture, but I didn't want white Ada fabric showing through underneath those straight stitches. So I cross stitched the base and I'm straight stitching over to give it both a little bit of volume and, uh, and so that the colors that are all mixing together look just right. Now I've got a dark gray metallic floss and this salmon color, DMC 3712. That's what I like to use for lips. And when I do beard, I will do the whole beard and mustache, and then I'll do the lips kind of over top it so that you can see that smile come through. You want to make sure you can see the mouth. And now I'm adding in the little piercings on the face, just one thread of that dark gray metallic floss in tiny little French knots on either side of the eye. Filling that in. And there are portions of the sleeves missing. That's because of the way I designed this portrait where characters are gonna be overlapping a little bit. So that's why that is there. And then I've just keep referencing photos. That's my number one tip is reference as many photos as you can to get the colors just right. I'm going through now in the neck area to fill in the, um, the tattoos of my character. And there's kind of a combination of like grayish hues, reddish hues, golden hues. Um, but again, it's all, with tattoos it's on the skin so there's always kind of that base color flesh tone that's going to affect you know you might know in theory that oh this is a red ink or this is a blue ink but you want to double check that against like a true blue or a true red and see you know just how red it is or just how gray it is because of the flesh tone that affects it as well as the age of the tattoo might fade over time. So keep those things in mind. Now, as you can see, this is what I mean. I'm just working really, really fine detail with literally half a thread of floss on that hat. And I have to keep it at a certain angle so that I can really see what I'm doing. And I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to see in this video, but you can sort of peek that that the words are coming together and using my extra fine beading needle, one half of one thread of floss, pull really gently because the fibers just rip right apart when you're doing that. Um, just go really slow, but you can get a lot better detail. And I, I was really glad that I did that. I think here I'm just touching up the beard. Wasn't totally satisfied with all of these stitches there. And this is actually me taking out what I did on the neck for the tattoos. I wasn't completely satisfied with it and I kept the camera rolling so that you could see how I go about removing this. So I'm using my little clippers really, really carefully. I have a very, very fine crochet hook that I can kind of pull at my threads with. I also use my needle as a tool and I get the point of my needle up and under threads that I wanna take out. And very, very gently, again, because I had stitched the flesh tone cross stitches underneath where I put the tattoo detailing, um, you just wanna be really, really careful as you snip and as you pull to get all of those threads off without affecting the stitching underneath. And then you can then you can start from scratch. So here I am just combining my colors again. I wasn't totally satisfied with my color combination or with the direction of the stitches as it related to my reference photos. So I just picked it out and I decided to start again and get it just right. So here I've decided to combine my threads. Before what I had done was like a combination of threads and here I'm sort of going one at a time, stacking the colors and getting them all in there just how I want to, to get it just right. So now I'm moving on to work on a little girl character. We again are starting from the feet, going up, 
like I said, I just like to give myself that baseline to understand and orient my character. You can see my little markings on the back. I'm just making sure that I'm staying where I need to go. Referencing my pattern all the while, making sure I don't miss a thing. And just filling in all of the uh, skin tone color, just because that's what the feet and legs happen to be for this particular design. So since I still had that length of floss, I went ahead and tackled the arm. I'm moving up to the face. I'll go back down the other arm, just kind of work my way around the pattern with the current floss color that I have. That tends to be a way that I do things. If I'm, if I'm going sort of from place to place to place and I feel like I'm going to have too much slack on the back, I might just run my needle through existing stitching just to kind of secure it down so it doesn't get too messy. Now I'm going to stitch the dress and the dress has a lot, it, uh, the pattern is like lemons with leaves. So what I'm doing is stitching a cross stitch base of gray and once I have all of the gray cross stitched, I will go over top that and make French knots with yellow to represent the lemons and straight stitches with green to represent the leaves. So one row at a time, we gotta get the base of that dress on in there and then we work sort of in layers. By we, I mean me. I don't know why I use that universal we. I guess it's because that's my suggestion to you is to work in layers. Do, 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 Stitch in a gray dress. Dun, dun. I have my bright pink nails because this was back when I did the, uh, it was around the time of my Michaels and DMC class um, for Valentine's Day. Stitching a floral motif for Valentine's Day class on Michaels Crafts website. So here's a little knot. My number one tip for knots is to remember there are less knots and more loops and to just take a breath, be patient, kind of pull and tug and pull and tug and you will work that knot right on out. So now I'm going to do the eyes because the hair is big and curly and sort of goes over the face. So again, if I'm thinking of layers, we have, you know, our skin and our eyes. And if we have hair going over that, I want to make sure I had the eyes in first. So I had some black left over from having done um, kind of the dad character and I filled those eyes in. Same thing with the mouth. It was just right there ready to go. So I just popped that in there. Now I'm doing my straight stitch in green to represent leaves of this lemon design on the dress. Because again, I sort of want the lemons to be on top of the leaves, so to speak. So I've laid down a little base of some straight stitches for leaves and now I've got three threads of yellow floss to represent my lemons. And as you can see, I'm very free with my hoop. I move it around, twist it around as much as I need to do what I need to do. And I'm doing bigger, looser French knots so that I get a, a, a bigger circle there instead of really tight, tiny French knots. If you wrap your floss around your needle more times and you sort of let it lay loosely and you don't pull it super tight, you'll get a nice round open looking French knot. That's great for, in this case, lemons or just bigger flowers generally. So now I'm gonna do a real hair technique for the little girl. And I like to tackle real hair about by outlining where the hair is going to go. So I've created a combination of threads. I have three different colors, one strand of each, and I've just outlined you know, around her head where the hair needs to go. It's sort of now all I have to do is color in the lines, so to speak. So now I'm filling in with randomized French knots all around her hair because when you're doing big curly hair, I like to combine both French knots and Boolean stitches so that it doesn't look too uniform. If this was somebody with really, really tight, clear ringlets, then I probably would just do Boolean stitches, but she's got this just like big, wonderful, wild curly hair. So I wanted it to feel a little fuller and look a little more randomized than just ringlet, ring, ringlet, ringlet all over. So I started with randomized French knots, some were tighter, some were looser, and now I'm working on filling in and around those French knots with the boolean stitch and combining three different colors to have your three strands and doing these boolean stitches and curly hair just really makes it look so dynamic i would totally recommend even if the the shades and hues that you're using are really really similar try mixing it up because it just gives a depth and a dynamic volume that looks really really great in here so apparently i'm taking a little snack break here so cheers to that and I've got a chip. I've been really into um, ruffles lately. Mm -hmm. I'm back. So 
So just finishing the, well, looking at it right side, her left side of the hair, referencing photos all the time, constantly, constantly look, see how the hair lays. Is it covering an eye? Is it up and over the eyebrow? How far back is that hairline? These are things that you definitely want to consider as you're stitching hair, especially with that real hair look, because when you commit to embroidery of that quote unquote real hair, there's a little less forgiveness in in the way the brain interprets the design, right? If it's just squares, if it's just cross stitch, your brain can sort of see the grid and go, oh, there's only so many possibilities, right? But when you're doing the real hair, you really want to be sure that you that you get it as close as possible. So as you can see, I'm finishing out the hair here. And I believe it was as a, as a fun surprise, I know this little lady wanted um, some color in her hair. And so when I stitched this portrait, um, again, because of reference photos, thank you, social media, there was a little bit of purple in there as a, as a fun thing. So I go back through with uh, purple floss and just do a couple little straight stitches, just kind of peeking through. I do a couple little French knots just throughout the bottom of the hair. I didn't want it to be too overpowering but I did sort of want to nod to the fact that the time of life that this portrait represents, that purple was in there. And it's those little details that make all the difference. People notice that and they'll go, oh my gosh, you know, that's, they know exactly when it was. Also with real hair, I like to take one thread of the flesh tone color and go over the part. Instead of just leaving it open, um, you know, from the stitches of the hair, it, it just gives it a little extra detail to take one thread, one little straight stitch to represent the part. And then I used pink thread to straight stitch the sandals on. And now I'm moving over to the mom character. So this portrait was primarily to commemorate the birth of a new baby. So I'm going to be stitching mom in a dress that uh, she wore a lot during the pregnancy because, you know, you find what you like and it's comfy. And then she's also going to be holding the baby. So as I'm building up the cross stitch base of this dress, you'll see I'm leaving out uh, on the right side, there's a line left out. That's where there's going to be a puppy, a little doggo who, who gets stitched right on in there. And then there's going to be some area left open where the baby's going to be going because she's going to be holding the baby. So as you see chunks missing, that's why. It's all part of the plan. <laughs> in this case, the dress that I'm stitching is a beautiful, solid dress. I think there's a technical term for this type of fabric, but it has that like raised um, little like polka dotty things on it. Um, it's not like a polka dot print, but it's like a little raised, almost embroidered polka dots dot pattern on it. So what I'm doing is stitching the base of the dress, just all in cross stitches, and then in like a very, very similar color as the dress, but a step lighter, just so it pops a little bit. I go over and just systematically stitched French knots all across the full dress to get that effect of the raised polka dot dress fabric. So you'll see that a little bit later. Stitching along, we are cross stitching. Apparently had some knots going on. I don't know what is going on there. Had a hard time getting going. <laughs> Trim it up, clean it up. That's one thing I like to just take care of business as it comes along. Um, and here I'm referencing the pattern quite a lot to make sure that I'm leaving room, counting appropriately. Where does the baby come in? Where are the baby's arms? Where does the mom's arms cross the body with the flesh colored stitches so that I don't have the dress in, in that place? You know, they call it counted cross stitch for a reason. Have to stop and do my counting. It's fun to watch this on replay. I rarely watch my videos like all the way through like this. So, okay, as you can see, I've got mom's dress done and I'm going to start to stitch her skin tone in. So I'm going to work with the arm first that comes down and crosses over to the baby. And I'm going to use the same color, I think, for the baby as well. So I'm filling in the baby's little legs and arms, the baby's head, and then I'll work my way up the chest, neck, and head for mom. See that coming in? It's so satisfying to watch it kind of just build its way up to the top. So switching out my floss as needed, run it out of lengths and whatnot. There we go, coming together nicely. 
Finishing off the skin tone in the face. Following my pattern to make sure I account for the hairline properly. And I'm going to do a real hair technique here as well, as you will see. First, I'm going to use just the three strands of DMC 310 that I have on hand to do the eyes. And I'm going to go ahead and work on the bebe as well as we go. Straight stitches for the mouth. Ah, now I'm working on the glasses. That's what I've got. So I've got a very dark gray one thread. I might have even, yes, I can tell. I think I even did the technique that I was mentioning for the hat text where, yes, I split the six strand floss, took one strand, and then very, very carefully untwisted that one strand into two very thin halves. And that gave me a much thinner piece of floss to work with so the glasses didn't overpower the face and I'm going to do that in the future because it's super worth it and now once again I've combined three different floss colors for the hair that match the person that I was stitching and I like to outline where the hair is going to go for that real hair technique just making sure my floss is secure the ends are tied down and I'm doing more big waves with, uh, with this hairstyle instead of tight curls. So I'm doing more straight stitches, but you definitely wanna reference photos as much as you can to make sure that the motion of those straight stitches mimics the wave and the natural look in the hair. So I'm kind of doing chunks at a time to get that wave kind of rolling out and around. Okay, so finishing up that hair, adding last minute details to make sure that wave is just right. I like to have a little tip come out to either side, you know, just to get those nice, those nice natural looking waves. Filling in the clothes on Bebe. Giving him a little heathered gray top and some uh, kind of dark denim-y bottoms just something real nice and neutral pre-securing my floss to give some uh, french knots for the shoes and now working on the color that i want to use for his hair i thought i had done that before the the thin i was working with was the glasses and i pulled that out and split it even thinner to do the glasses now i'm doing the hair on the baby which is ultimately just like three or four little straight stitches just to put on top there little baby wisps of hair So now I've added a little smile to the baby with that uh, DMC 3712, which is my favorite mouth color. And I've now got one thread of a very, very light pumpkin orange color um, that's very similar to the one that I, I cross-stitched the dress with, but just a shade lighter. And I'm going through and just making a grid of French knots one by one by one. I'm being very careful to try and make them as uniform as possible and not pull them through from front to back, which does happen a couple of times. I think my getting the floss box out there was, I initially started making French knots with the same color that I cross-stitched the dress with, but I didn't like how that looked. So I, I picked them out, got out my floss box, and chose a shade lighter just so that it shows up a little bit better as it would in real life because a raised polka dotted kind of look on a fabric is going to catch the light a little bit differently than the fabric that's just flat beneath it. So it does stand to reason that it might uh, pop a slightly different color or be lit a you know, slightly different way. So just making French knots all over the place. I'm trying to keep them, you might be able to see or not I'm keeping it very systematized so if you look closely and I can zoom in a little bit later uh, I it is really a a true grid of polka dots because that's how the fabric would be as opposed to a randomized graphic pattern the polka dots here really are are very consistent so I kept them consistent in the way that I stitched them onto the pattern So 
so many French knots. <laughs> if you ever need French knot practice, do something with polka dots. So now I am finally approaching the top of the dress. <laughs> Just took me 400 years of French knots. 400 years of heartache. The heartache, just precision. <laughs> oh. Okie dokie. So we've got all the humans stitched. And, oh, it looks like I, oh, that's right. I was not satisfied with the baby's eyes. So I cut them off. They were French knots and they were very big. So I think what I did is made new French knots just using one thread instead of the two or three that I had before so that the little baby's eyes are a little more appropriately sized to his tiny little baby head. All righty. So, it looks like at some point in there, I also stitched on mom's got a piercing right under her lip. And I stitched French knots in the same uh, metallic dark gray that I used for dad's piercings. And now I'm gonna work on the pupper. As with hair, and especially using that real hair embroidery techniques, I always recommend using numbers of threads, even if they're really, really close in color. Like if it appears a dog is one solid color, if you look really close at their fur and look at the way their fur shines in the sunlight, you'll see that no dog is truly just one solid color. There are variations in even just one strand, one hair of fur. So I like to choose a combination just to help convey that nuance of color in your pet or in somebody's hair. So with this dog, I've got sort of a darker, medium, and lighter tone, you know, blondish tan for the fur. And I do just cross stitch the whole body and the head, but by using this uh, floss combination, because this dog doesn't have any particular, you know, spots or patches or anything, I'm able to stitch the full body, but it still looks more dynamic than it would otherwise, because there is a little bit of light, medium, and dark tone happening in the fur color across the cross stitching. So definitely always recommend combining three colors if you're using three strands of floss to just um, flesh that out for lack of a better term. Now I'm doing the kind of pointy ears, dogs always uh, on alert looking around. And I'm just going to add in the details of the face. So using one thread of black, I'm filling in kind of a big open smile. It looks like dogs are smiling when they're panting. So I've got a big open mouth. I've added French knots for the eyes and nose, making sure the nose is slightly bigger. And I add one little stitch of pink for a tongue coming out there. We've got a sweet little doggo. And now I know I'm off screen a little bit, but it's because I'm doing some detail work. There, I believe I was adding um, a few uh, tattoo details to dad's hands with that one strand of black. So just kind of going through last checks there on the family side. Now I'm going to do something that I've never done before. Like I mentioned, I wanted to do a different background. I didn't want just florals. I didn't want just a name. Um, I wanted to try black work. I've never done a black work piece before, and I thought it would be really, really cool to do a gradient, kind of dark to light black work border around the family. So I went online, I found a black work, just it's a traditional pattern that I really, really liked. And as you can see, I shifted my work into a, I believe that is an eight inch or 10 inch embroidery hoop. And I used a smaller six inch embroidery hoop to center up around the family. I trace that around and now I'm just tracing that line with my dark, dark gray floss. I didn't want to go black because I didn't want it to be too intense. Just I want the family to still be the focus. And I felt like a dark, dark black would be too much, too distracting, too overwhelming. So I used a dark gray, three strands around the circles. And I ended up doing two circles around the outside. And on the black work that starts right up to the edge, about a quarter of an inch of black work around 
I use three strands of the dark gray. And then I move, as you can see, this circle is a little lopsided. I ended up actually taking it out and completely redoing it. Um, I don't know if I caught that on video, but it is something that I do. There it is. See, now it's better. <laughs> I was going to say, there got to be a point where I was like, I can't film this because I have to keep it flat and it's hard to work with. And I think that's part of the reason it was a little crooked in the first place. So I actually undid it and like looked really close right in front of my face and redid it instead of at the funny film angle. So now, as you can see, I'm using still that same dark gray color. Uh, the backdrop is a little different because I had my Valentine's Day class with Michaels and had a different background. So now I'm on to my little pink pinkish purple background. And I use three strands of the dark gray to start with this black work pattern. And I go all the way around. And then I go down to two threads of the dark gray, go all the way around. I go down to one thread of the dark gray, go all the way around. Then I switch floss colors entirely. And I think I use two threads of sort of a medium gray and then one thread of it. And then one thread of like a light, light gray. So my brain, I have to tell you, it took me forever to adjust to making this black work pattern work. I kept referencing the pattern. I just kept every, literally every stitch. It just to get the pattern in my mind's eye took forever. I think it wasn't until I had gone all the way around at least once with the three strands of the dark gray, maybe even to the two strands that I actually was able to sort of anticipate what was next instead of staring at my little pattern guide and reorienting myself. So with black work, my number one advice now that I've tried it is to just take your time, reference the pattern like crazy, because it's going to be really hard to go back and fix mistakes if you make them because it's so precise. You have so little wiggle room. You've got to get it right from the start. So luckily, it's a repeated pattern and it just keeps doing the same thing over and over and over. But you got to make sure, especially if you're using a more complicated pattern, I don't know if I would consider mine more complicated or not. It's just the one I chose. But if you find the pattern that you're working with to feel really complicated, just really take your time, really reference that pattern, get it right from the start. You'll be glad that you took the time. I also was trying to be careful with my straight stitches and make sure that my floss wasn't twisting as it was laying down into the holes, that it was kind of flat, that it was looking nice, looking uniform. Um, there got to be a point on the backside where I don't know how messy or neat it is, but I just wanted to get the front right. So that was my primary focus. And I just worked my way around and around and around. And eventually it got to the point that, I mean, it just was so time consuming, way more time consuming than I would have even thought. Um, so just be prepared, <laughs> be prepared for it to be very detailed, feel a little like minutia and be prepared to put in a lot of time because it's again very precise one little stroke at a time to build up these really cool lines now i do think it was totally worth it i'm really glad i tried um, and i think the payoff was really really good i love the way the final portrait turned out but if you decide to tackle something similar i highly recommend just taking it slow and knowing that it will be slow um one thing you might have noticed too on the back side of my fabric is i i did a loose outline around the family characters, maybe like a quarter of an inch from the edge of the family all the way around. I just sort of traced with my pencil so that I knew where to stop with the black work as it came closer and closer and closer to the people. And it helped me gauge too how how much of the, you know, three strands of the dark floss I wanted. Because as you can see here on kind of if if my circle is a clock, down here I'm working around like four o'clock, right? And the tail of the dog is kind of right there versus under the feet, I have way more space. So I was able to gauge that like, okay, I don't want to go up too far with my three threads of dark gray on that right side at four o'clock near the dog tail because I have less space to get all those other uh, gradations of, of gray. So you just want to plan it out, think ahead. And this is, I, I went from thick, dark, floss to thin light floss. I made a gradient out of it as I got closer to the middle. You don't have to do that. Maybe you're just doing a light gray. Maybe you're doing a fun color. It's totally up to you. So that this, you know, might not even be a problem for you to have to think through going from dark to light, but I'm just walking you through kind of how I, how I tackled it. I do recall that I stitched a lot of this <laughs> at a friend's house, a uh, Super Bowl party. <laughs> so there will come a point where you don't see me stitching as much and I've gone off with Spencer to a friend's house and I finish it up at a Super Bowl party. Um, but 
we do catch a lot of the beginning of it, which gives you kind of definitely the feel of how this all comes together. And then we're going to go over how I framed it and put it in the backing. Put in the backing, put on the backing. I'm not sure. So it really just is more of the same for quite a long time. Hours and hours and hours. And as you can see, I, there are places where like I don't finish a full shape and I don't finish a full motif because again, I want the gradient to feed into itself a little bit. So I want these three strands of dark gray to go into two strands and to have it really connect very seamlessly and not, you know, really systematize. I don't want it to be very obvious where those connections are. So it's a little bit variable around the edges where I leave it open for the two strands to connect. And then similarly, when I do all the way around using just two strands, I leave it similarly kind of randomized open areas for that one thread to come on in and then the lighter gray and, and so on because I wanted it to feel very organic as it approaches uh, as it approaches the center. And I don't outline the center with a straight stitch or a running stitch or back stitch or anything. I just sort of let the black work gradually creep in and stop. It's sort of like a vine. Um, so it just sort of reaches in and eventually dissipates because it goes dark to light and then it's the family in the center. Part of me thinks I should just skip ahead early. <laughs> but I've still got a few more minutes of this um, coming together. Gosh, I skipped forward a couple minutes and you can see I haven't made super progress. It's just tedious. And it uses a lot more floss than I thought it would. I was swapping my floss out constantly. All right, so as you can see, I have made a lot of progress between when I stopped recording and started recording again. I finished out all that black work and I've also got an auburn hoop. I've put my work into the auburn hoop. It's a little bit of a struggle, I find. Auburn hoops are really, really tight, really secure. It's a good thing and a bad thing. The good thing is once you get it, it is secure. It's not going anywhere. The bad thing is if you don't get it centered on the first try, you sort of have to wrestle with it to get it back out, readjust it, and cross your fingers that you're going to get it centered on the second try. It's a bit of a process, but I do like the way the auburn hoops so I've also got my felt ready and I've got a water soluble pencil just it's white it's going to show up a little bit better on that felt and the auburn hoop I'm using I believe is a seven inch hoop and so I've got a seven inch uh, bamboo embroidery hoop that I can use that's going to fit right in there and I use that hoop uh, shape to trace a circle of felt I trace with that white pencil I cut that out I trim my fabric back and now I've got a matching floss that I can use to sort of tack that circle of felt onto the back to finish that backing up really, really nicely. So I've made a cross stitch actually to secure my floss and just pull that up and through. I'm just doing tiny little stitches and, you know, catching the felt, going back into the Ada fabric and, you know, going down an inch, catching the felt back and, and so on and so on and so on. Just tacking that in as I go. And it's just a matter of making sure that it's laying flat, that you're tucking all the Ada fabric edges um, under, under and keeping it all flat and tucked in. Um, I don't know that there's any particularly precise or scientific way to do it or even to describe it to you. Hopefully you can sort of gather what I'm doing, just coming in from under, really, really close to the edge, grabbing that Ada fabric, grabbing that felt, tacking it and moving on and doing it again all the way around. You can also see that between the time I finished the portrait and did the backing for the portrait, I changed my nail color and got it ready for my Easter egg class with Michaels. <laughs> nice light blue and Easter pastels on my ring fingers. Just a fun thing I like to do. So I just work my way around and, and obviously the closer you get to your starting point, the harder it's going to be because you've got less and less slack to work with. You can't open it up quite as far, can't make as many adjustments as you go. So it's just... I, I don't know, this is just a way that I figured out to do the backing and it's just a matter of patience and trial and error to really secure it on there. And like all things with cross stitch, it just takes time. <laughs> One stitch at a time. 
and I ran out of floss. So I, as you can see, kind of looped over myself to really secure down where I had ended. I secure my floss again and I get going. And I guess you could use regular sewing thread. I'm not much of a sewer, so I just use floss for this. I use three strands because that's what I'm used to working with, with cross stitching. I find it to be um, strong, easy to use, kind of no big deal. And here I am just making sure things are tucked, rolling it under, making sure it's flat, pulling it tight. Like I said, it's not too scientific. It's just trial and error. And at the very end, I kind of, as you can see, I'm like scooting it through, trying to get it up and over the wood. It gets a little bit of a struggle at the end. And I just make a knot and I kind of tuck it under and try and make it look as finished as possible. And now I'm just adding a little, um, sort of a little monogram at the back. I'm stitching just a little heart and the numbers two one because this is to represent uh, baby being born in 2021. So... I, like many of you, I'm sure, have <laughs> delivered handmade gifts a little bit late. <laughs> we are well into 2022. Of course, I was able to deliver this as a gift some weeks ago. It takes a little longer to edit the videos and everything. But um, all is to say, you know, the best laid plans, blah, 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 whatever that saying is. Um, so, yes, the date is 2021 on the back of this. <laughs> So I'm just doing some satin stitches with red floss to make a little heart made with love. Using the tip of my needle to sort of brush through those strokes, make sure they lay nice and flat. Got like a nice little work, kind of a squatty little heart. Turned out really cute. And then I'm using white floss to um, straight stitch a two and a one for 2021. wanted that to show up really nice against the gray and like I'm probably could have done this before I put the backing on but I didn't think of it till after and thought oh yeah I want to want to do that so there we go and now once again using my needle as a tool just brushing it up making it look good so there is my portrait my black work background portrait I hope you enjoyed this video I know it was long well done for making it to the end but I hope that was informative and fun and interesting for you and hopefully inspires you with many more ideas of how to do similar things in your portraits and spend a lot of patient time doing them. So thanks for watching everybody. Have a wonderful day. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to our channel. We're gonna be adding more and more videos over the course of this year. Instructional videos, ideas videos, alternate ways to stitch people patterns. It's gonna be a lot of fun. So subscribe to YouTube, follow us on Instagram at Stitch People, follow us in all the places. We've got a lot of really fun stuff coming down the pike. So. Have a great day, everyone, and thanks again. Bye for now.